Hi. Um, so for this talk, um, myself and Michael will be alternating between uh, it to go through different parts in this talk. Um, but it's describing the work that we've done together. Just to mention a little bit about uh, what we've done is um, from 2010 to 2014, uh, we spent, well, five years working, looking at the data from weather balloons, which um, there is launched once to four times a day around the world in about a thousand stations around the world. And these go up into the atmosphere and they record temperature, pressure and various stuff. And so we did started doing analysis to see what's happening in the atmosphere. This is data going back to the 50s. And we found a load of different results. And we realized that there was a lot of paradigms in current atmospheric modeling that uh, people had never tested. And we had so much, we couldn't fit it into one single peer-reviewed paper. And we decided, look, let's just put everything up onto a website um, and put it out for open peer review. So we set up the open peer review journal and most of the work that we'll be talking about, you can get on this. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some newer work in, in the future, or t uh, towards the end of the talk. But the first part, I'm going to talk about the history of atmospheric measurements. Then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Michael, who's my father. Um, and he's going to talk about the work that I was describing in the that you can get those papers on the Open Peer Review Journal. And then finally, we're just going to present a sneak preview of some of the newer work that we are preparing for submitting. Uh, to for peer review. So, what I'd like you to get from uh, from this first part is that all of the models and uh, most of our understanding of what's happening in the atmosphere is based on measurements that were done on ground. And uh, this, so I'll give you examples. So this was one of the first key discoveries, uh, which was. Well, Columbus used this to great advantage in that um, you, he found that, I don't know if you can see the, the map on the thing where you can see the voyages that were done to the Americas. And they found that it, by going in a particular direction, go when they're going west and then east, they were able to take advantage of the prevailing easterlies and westerlies. And that sped up the journey quite a bit. So this was like obviously a major advantage. So in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, we had a lot of very prominent scientists trying to figure out why, why are these prevailing winds there? And these, of course, were ground-based measurements. They're, they're real measurements taken by explorers. So you have people like Hadley, Halley of Halley's Comet fame and Farrell developing this. The other method, if you want to, Find, if you want to go up and find what's happening higher up in the atmosphere, in the old days, you had to climb a mountain. So you actually had most of the meteorologists, when they wanted to look at what's happening up, would climb up mountains. Mont Blanc in uh, Europe is the highest mountain in Europe. It's five kilometers, about three, three miles above sea level. One of the results which most of us probably already know is that as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets colder with height. And um, the lapse rate, the rate at which you do it, is, it works out at about 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And here's another example. Spectroscopy is looking at light and the, uh, the be, I try, it's a lot of you would probably be familiar with spectroscopy, but it's essentially you're looking at the wavelengths of light and different things and trying to infer information about this. So the ozone layer was first identified by looking at, early, in the early 20th century, by looking at spectrophotometers and looking at the light that was coming through the atmosphere and they noticed that there were these peaks or missing bits in the spectra that were due to ozone and they realized that the ozone 
was existing somewhere up in the atmosphere and it was later identified as being about 40 kilometers up in the atmosphere is the ozone layer. Um, another example that's quite uh, f uh, well known, it was by John Tyndall, who was an Irish man, and so it must have been good. Um, and so he showed that if you look at the infrared light, he found that um, if you look in the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen are almost transparent to infrared light, but that water vapor, CO2 and methane, that they are infrared active, what we'd call infrared active. That means they can absorb and emit a particular frequencies of IR. And yes, well, here we are. Uh, 50, days, 50 years ago today, uh, the, um, the eagle was landing, it was launched, and uh, I think, I don't know the exact time, I think it's supposed to, it landed uh, probably it tomorrow morning or something like that, and um, so that was kind of the culmination of, uh, in many sense, the space race. And another aspect of the space race was people started launching satellites. And in 1960, the US started the series of first weather satellites were launched, and they're still running now. We're on I think, the 45th Tiras satellite at the moment. So what I just want to show you, it's great now with the space, after the space race, we now are able to look from above the atmosphere. But here's what's happening. You know, most of our measurements were done from below the atmosphere. Now we're looking at it from above the atmosphere. And if you want to look at what's inside the atmosphere, that's if you want to understand what's happening, you need to look within the atmosphere. And on the main data set that you can do is weather balloons. So this has a history going back to the early, uh, late 19th century, even earlier, but uh, we had uh, just on the cusp of the uh, early of the 19th to 20th century, we had a number of European groups that were started using both manned and unmanned uh, weather balloons. Now I liked, I found this nice um, uh, drawing uh, by from one of the the pilots for the uh, German group uh, that was also a an artist. And so he's the guy on the right holding that uh, the bag, you know, and that was Hans Gross. Uh, but he drew that this painting of what it was like a few years after he had been in it. But independently, both the French group uh, that was just using unmanned balloons and the German group in 1902, they discovered what we now call the tropopause. Uh, though they initially called it the stratosphere. And so what was this tropopause stratosphere? Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets colder with height. But they were discovering this odd phenomenon where it starts to actually remain constant with height. You go up and it doesn't get colder. And later on, it was discovered there was another region where as you go up even further, it starts getting hotter with height. And this was a, a major puzzle. And um, I, yeah, so the, the logic, all done from ground without measurements, was that they were saying, well, you know, hot air rises, uh, so all else being equal. And so they said, well, if the temperature's not getting colder with height, you can't have circulation. And so they assumed it must be that the air is stratified into non-mixing layers. They didn't actually notice, they weren't measuring it, but they just as an assumption they made, and that's where the name stratosphere came from, that the air was stratified, and they said, where is tropos turning or mixing? The troposphere they, is mixed. So that was just a ground-based assumption, looking at these early weather balloon models. And we can see as you go up in the atmosphere, we now know, looking at using rocket sounds, that uh, you can see that as you go up even higher, the stratosphere starts to pause again, and then it starts to decrease with height again. Then we get an, another thing. So we have this back and forth, and uh, if you see a shooting star, it's probably in uh, around the mesosphere, mesopause region. Um, 
But for the rest of the talk, we're just going to focus on the lower three regions. You see the stratosphere, tropopause, and troposphere. And that's the region that the balloons go up to 35 kilometers, about 20, 22 miles or something. Yeah, and that um, in terms of the mass of the atmosphere, that comprises 99% of the air mass. So it's the bulk of the mass. And um, yeah, I, you, yeah, so we just, the old days, uh, the early balloons, they used to put a little, the balloon burst, it could uh, land like 200 miles away from where it was launched. So in order to get the data back, they would put a little reward sign, note in with the measurements, and say, if found, please return to the meteorological observatory and you'll get the equivalent of probably like $20 or something like that. Um, but then in the 30s, they invented uh, radio transmitters got so cheap that it then became standard. So now you'll hear the term radio sound used for a weather balloon so sounding sand for sounding and it was the name came from the the nautical term where people would throw a the uh, do a sounding going down into the ocean and they said well we're kind of doing the reverse doing a sounding going vertically so um what in terms of the development of our understanding of the current textbook understanding of climate and atmosphere there were two main puzzles that were captivating scientists in the early, uh, early 20th, late 19th century. Why were there ice ages? That was the first one. At this stage, they already knew that there must have been at least four periods in the last million years, uh, and we now know there is, there is more, it's roughly about 10, uh, where the France, uh, Europe, and uh, Americas were covered with glaciers, almost covered, and then into a inter what we now call an interglacial period like today, where that's not the case. So they wanted to know why did that happen. The other one was this new discovery of a tropopause stratosphere, and they're like, what's happening here? And because the ozone layer was discovered around the same time, around 1912, um, the assumption was it's probably something to do with the ozone layer. Um, people that are familiar with the climate change debate now, you'll, you might recognize that a lot of the topics of the theories that people were proposing for explaining the Ice Age, non-Ice Age, are still uh, the main topics that people are doing here, changes in solar variability, the Earth's orbit, changes in water, cloud cover, CO2, volcanic eruptions. Uh, the, I just think that it's interesting, I'll just talk about it on the next slide, but in the late 19th century, one of the, pro uh, the main ones that was being proposed was that CO2 was responsible for all of the Earth's climate change, and including the ice ages. Then, nowadays, the prevailing consensus by the IPCC and others is that, oh no, the ice ages are due to the Milankovitch cycles, changes in the Earth's orbit. But we are still holding on to this notion that the CO2 is dominant for short-term uh, climate changes. So we'll, Michael will talk a little bit about that later on in his section. But you can just to show you, a lot of people often hear of Svante Arrhenius. Oh, in the 19th century, they already had proved that CO2 was the driver of climate. Well, in the 19th century, about a few years later, his a Swedish colleague, our, our contemporary Nut Angstrom, who was the son of Anders Angstrom, that's the unit is named after, of Angstrom is named after, he went and read the papers and decided to do experiments, did one of the first uh, systematic reviews of the uh, IOR spectrum of CO2, and his results were saying, no, CO2 was not the driver. Um, George Simpson is a very interesting guy. He was one of the surviving members of Scott of Antarctic's expedition. So 
Uh, he was the meteorological uh, scientist, so he stayed at the base camp. So, like many of you will, are probably familiar with uh, uh, Robert Scott's Antarctic Tragic Expedition, they got to the South Pole um, a few day, uh, shortly after uh, Raoul Amundsen, but then they, they died on the way back. But because George Simpson was still at base camp, he survived. He later went on to have a very prestigious career, uh, director of the Brit British Meteorological Office. He was knighted. And uh, one, the, what a reason that I'm mentioning it here is in the 20s and 30s, he looked at both of those two puzzles. And he was using, because he was in the meteorological thing, he had access to all the weather balloons. When he did his analysis and calculations, he concluded CO2 was not the driver of the ice age cl of climate change. He was very categorical about that. He said temperatures in the troposphere were not driven by radiative processes. Uh, which I'll talk a bit about later, and he said mm, probably convection was more important, but he argued that mm, the stratosphere, his calculations, maybe radiation was involved, he said it's probably something to do with ozone, but he put in the caveats that there was a lot of inconsistencies with the theory and the data, which Michael will talk about later on. Most of this work was done with very either without computers or before with very early computers. And so you were very limited in what you could do. So a philosophy that seems to have been popular was the pick one thing approach. So Gilbert Plass, he explicitly stated in one of his papers, he was going to try and explain every possible climate change that occurred in terms of CO2. And his logic was, he said, well, presumably somebody else will try and look at other factors and whatever the truth is between it all, we'll eventually get to the truth. But it seems that Plus, uh, nobody else took him up on that offer. And so a lot of these uh, uh, the theories about CO2 as a driver relates back to Plas and those papers. El Sazer, he went and he tried to describe the entire atmospheric temperature profile using radiative processes, ignoring convection or anything like that, but just using radiative processes. And uh, interestingly, this was a puzzle because we, he keeps referring to what Einstein had found in the photoelectric effect, but he, there's the mention, there is no mention of the name Einstein in his uh, 1942 Harvard monograph. And this, I, we were kind of looking at it and then Michael pointed out, oh, uh, that, you know, that Einstein was in Princeton at the time. So you couldn't mention in a Harvard monograph the Princeton professor. So, um, so you'll see a lot of people referring to Kirchhoff's laws in when they're using climate modeling, and they're actually referring to Einstein's laws, but they're using El Sazer's book, which rebranded Einstein as Gustav Kirchhoff had discovered everything. Well, so Manabe and Strickler, who uh, they went on that l what later became NOAA GFDL's uh, Princeton, uh, ironically Princeton group in a climate modeling group, they tried to use El Sazer's data um, in the 60s to explain the entire tropopause stratosphere and troposphere in terms of radiative processes. But there was a big problem. Remember I said that the lapse rate was six and a half degrees per Celsius per kilometer in the troposphere. When they did their calculations, they kept getting minus 16, nearly three times the rate of cooling. And they also were calculating that the ground temperature was of the order of 160 Fahrenheit. Now, uh, I'm coming from Ireland, so when I arrived here in Tucson, it did feel a little like that, but I think maybe not that high. And uh, so I, he, they did find, though, that the stratosphere kind of looks about right. And so George Simpson, that I mentioned earlier, the guy in uh, Scott of Antarctic's group, he... Um, 
he had looked at similar calculations and he concluded, well, clearly the troposphere is not dominated by the radiative process, and that's why he was saying it's probably convection. Manabe and Strickler went a different route. They said, so let's just keep adjusting our models. And so what they do is they would put in a, an arbitrary, if they found the lapse rate was getting too high or rapid after it, in, during the simulation, they would just artificially put in a thing to shove the data, their model thing, back so that it matches to minus six and a half. They, didn't really, they said, well, it's probably something to do with convection, so it's called a convective adjustment. And um, the uh, Apollo mission used the IBM 7090 supercomputer and uh, was incredibly advanced. Of course, now you have a smartphone. Is the only thing that has, everything has gotten bigger with the smartphone, the CPU, the RAM, the only thing that's gotten smaller is the size. So, and, uh, so you would say, yes, yeah, so we've had massive improvements in the supercomputers. But what have they done with it? Climate modelers have improved the resolution and they've added in extra components. Th these two uh, schematics, by the way, that you can see on the thing, are taken from the IPCC Fort Assessment Report. This is their own description, the IPCC's description of how climate models have advanced. What I want to point out is that the fundamental, what's called the physics, in, in the, the jargon is what they'll use, is that, that, that radiatively dominated was the main driver. That was never checked, and they just keep on using that. And the implications? Well, if the atmosphere is dominated, temperature profile is dominated by uh, radiative processes, well, as Tyndall had shown, uh, it, CO2 and water vapor and methane and ozone are the, the key components there. And so they, they said, well, if you increase CO2, which we now know is occurring, you know, and Manu Loa shows that it has increased, uh, then they predicted, so you will get global warming. And they were predicting this in the 60s. Manabe and Wetherald, 1967, I think, was the first to, with computer model to make that prediction. Uh, there were some other ones uh, earlier on. Uh, but, like, it was, the problem was that at the time, it was global cooling was occurring <laughs> from the 40s to the 70s. And so that was a big problem. But then in the 80s, it started warming again. And so the climate modelers uh, declared vindication. And famously, a particular James Hansen in the NASA modeling group, he went and testified for, uh, towards Al Gore. And he's, as a result, yeah, the greenhouse effect, enhanced greenhouse effect theory became mainstream, was reported around the world. It led to the setting up of the IPCC, the UN, uh, also the UN COP agreements all arose out of that where people are trying to cut down CO2 emissions, uh, have international negotiations to do that. That all went on uh, in parallel to while the the uh, UN was trying to negotiate all of these agreements and the Paris 2015 agreement comes from that line of the UN. The IPCC was supposed to actually go and check the results, but they'd already decided in 1988 that the science was settled, apparently. Um, just want to end this first part by pointing out this quote, or this fame, a line from Joni Mitchell's song, and I think to, to do the analogy, to paraphrase, that people, you know, we have looked at the atmosphere from both sides now, from above the atmosphere and below the atmosphere, but until you actually look in the atmosphere, you don't really know what's happening. And I'll now hand it over to Michael. I'm just going to briefly summarize the scientific method, uh, because this is what we use when we're analyzing the weather balloons. We don't use models or anything like that, and we don't adjust the data. We just use this particular method. So basically, what a scientist does is he'll do a set of experiments. He'll collect a whole big pile of data and make observations, and we call these facts. 
Um, and then if he can come up with an equation that will describe all this set of data, then these are called laws. But if you come up with something new, uh, a, a scientist really wants to explain why is it happening. Laws tell you what happens and how they happen, but they don't tell you why. So the first thing you do then is you make a guess as to why it happens, and we call this a hypothesis. And this is where the scientific method comes in, because what, as a scientist, you're then obliged to put your guess to all of the tests that you can think of, and maybe get other people to come up with other tests. And what happens is, uh, if it survives all the tests, then you have a theory. Um, and, uh, but the unfortunate thing is, if, if uh, any facts are not explained by your guess, or your hypothesis, then it's wrong. So uh, that was summed up uh, by famously by Richard Feynman, where he said, it doesn't matter how smart a person is, it doesn't matter how beautiful the uh, hypothesis is, uh, one ugly fact that disagrees with it, it destroys the whole thing. So uh, the other thing is that if you have two or more theories <coughs> that explain all the facts, then what we use is the principle of Occam's razor, who was an 11th century monk, and he said, if two or more theories explain all the facts, pick the simplest one. So that basically is the scientific method, in a nutshell. Now let's have a look at the uh, weather balloon data. This is a typical weather balloon, and attached onto the bottom of it there, you'll see the little uh, instrument package, which measures the temperatures and so on. Uh, and what do you get from this weather balloon? The weather balloon nowadays, they're filled with hydrogen or helium, and they go up to about 20, uh, 25 miles, and then they burst, and all the way up, they're sending back all of this information. It takes about 90 minutes for it to get to 25 miles or so. Uh, and this is what you'll get back, a whole list of data. Now, this is only about a third of the data, but it gets the point across. And what you can see is that there are uh, temperature measurements, uh, pressure measurements and so on. And then there are certain uh, levels called mandated pressure levels, which I've underlined some of them there, the ones on this section in red, uh, and they're obliged to take those measurements uh, regardless. So what do you get when you have your weather balloon data? Well here, I've taken uh, the weather balloon data from this day last year in Tucson, and uh, also one on the 1st of January for this year in Tucson. And I've plotted here the temperature uh, versus the, um, uh, the uh, height, or the pressure as you go up. So down the green bit down there represents the ground, and the top scale across there is in degrees Kelvin, which is the scientifically used temperature. Uh, it's uh, zero degrees centigrade, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, is 273 degrees Kelvin. So you can see on the uh, uh, Tucson one there, the temperature is about uh, 31, 32. That would be, uh, uh, sorry, 310 or something like that. That would be about uh, 40 degrees centigrade, or 100 and something Fahrenheit. Uh, so I just picked the January and July one. One is in the evening and one is in the morning for to illustrate the difference between summer and, uh, and winter and day and night. Now before I can start showing you how we analyze that, I have to summarize uh, the gas laws. I'm sorry to have to bore you with this, but I know most of you may have forgotten most of them. So this is a quick summary. Uh, Boyle, who again was another Irishman and had to be right as well, he, <laughs> he said that if you increase the pressure on a gas, it gets smaller. Um, so if you double the pressure, you half the volume. If you half the pr uh, pressure, you get the volume. Uh, you will uh, double the volume. And then you had Charles Law, uh, Law who was a, 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 a Frenchman, and he was the first guy to ever man a balloon. So he was the first ma man. Uh, uh, flight in a balloon. Uh, he said if you heat a gas it expands uh, and if you cool the gas it, it's easier to squeeze it back down into a small volume again. And the last uh, law that we have in the gas laws is Avogadro's law and he just simply said that if you have two gases occupying the same volume it doesn't matter what the gases are. One could be hydrogen, a very light gas. The other might be carbon dioxide which is a lot heavier and made up of three atoms. The type of atoms or molecules doesn't matter. All that matters is that they have the same number 
of uh, molecules in the gas. If they occupy the same volume, they have the same number. And uh, we measured, count the number of molecules in a unit called moles. A mole is a very large number there. It's 6 by 10 to the 23. Uh, and in honor of uh, Avogadro, it's called Avogadro's numbers. So N, therefore, is the number of moles that you would have in a cubic meter uh, of air. So if you combine those three gases together, or those three gas laws together, you get what's called the ideal gas law. And in thermodynamics, this represents the equation of state of the ideal gas. So basically, in thermodynamics, if, uh, if a gas is obeying the gas law, it's said to be in thermodynamic equilibrium. And this will be an important point that we'll get to later on. Uh, so you can rearrange the gas law or the equation of state into the molar density form. And uh, what you'll see then is you get uh, D, uh, which is P N over P, the number of moles per unit volume or per square me a cubic meter. Uh, that's uh, uh, what it tells you is that if D is very low, the molecules are spread far apart. And if D is very high, the molecules are squashed close together. So how does this allow us to analyze uh, the uh, weather balloon data. Well, the first thing I'll tell you is nobody that I know of, until myself and Ronan, have analyzed the weather balloon data in terms of D, the molar density. Even though it is an equation uh, of state, it's just representing the same one in a slightly different form. Uh, but nobody taught to analyze the data in this particular way. Uh, and uh, the reason why this is of use is that if you take this January profile here and look at how the temperature is changing as you go up through the atmosphere, it's fairly wobbling back and forth and so on. But if I transfer that data and represent it in terms of molar density, what I end up with is two straight lines. And this is what's quite a surprise. Um, and uh, just to show you that these really are straight lines, uh, you can see the little circles represent the actual measurements. And if you look at the correlation, uh, it shows it's extremely good. Uh, the R squared factor, if it's one, it means it's a perfect straight line. If it's zero, there's no linear correlation at all. But these, these data uh, things are quite good. Now, <clears throat> the thing is that uh, that one was taken in the evening. Uh, or sorry, taken in the morning, uh, what we find is that if you take it during the day after the sun has heated it up, the ground level uh, is represented by a third line. But the interesting, and I'll get into that a bit, a bit later, uh, the interesting thing is that we can now find that we can divide the atmosphere into three different regions, uh, and each of these have their own separate, separate equation of state. So that means within each of these regions, the air is in thermodynamic equilibrium, and that will have implications that I'll get into later. And the other thing is that at night, when the sun goes down, uh, you lose that bottom uh, boundary layer, and it just becomes the same as the rest of the tropopause. So we analyzed all of the 20 million radio sons that have been launched since the 1950s, uh, I spent over an hour counting them. We found that was, there were, uh, the same thing applied to all 20 million. Uh, there was two, they were either represented by two uh, straight lines or three straight lines, depending on whether it was day or night. Uh, and to show that this wasn't just cherry picking two, what I have done is uh, we did the video for all of the radio songs for Tucson here for last year. And just to explain that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, what you can see here again is uh, the but vertical axis is the temp uh, pressure. You're going from the ground upwards. But the thing I want you to take away from this is that uh, if you look at the right-hand side, I fitted just the, the night rate ones. I didn't bother with the day ones because it would have been wibbling back and forth a bit. But if you look there, uh, you can see that uh, all of the, the weather balloon data are all fitted by the same two straight lines. But the interesting thing is the the horizontal line shows where these two lines intersect. And that's the start of the tropopause every single time. And the thing about it is, is it jumps up and down. It can jump up by as and down by as much as 20% of the atmosphere in as little as 12 hours. It's a very rapidly changing phenomenon, uh, which has a lot of implications, which we get into later. So just to continue with the explanation then, 
I, I just want to rotate the, this graph by uh, 90 degrees so that the ground is uh, on the right hand side and the pressure uh, is on the bottom and the molar density is the vertical axis. So that's what I'm doing here. And the reason I do this is that as chemists, it's quite common for us to want to measure uh, how the molar density behaves with, with pressure because it tells us something about the compressibility of a gas. So normally you take an ideal gas and by the way under the conditions that we have in the atmosphere oxygen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, they are all ideal gases. Uh, so under those circumstances and water vapor is an ideal gas provided the humidity is less than 100, but if you uh, increase the humidity above 100, then it ceases to be an ideal gas. That's just a side effect. Um, so the thing about a gas is the more compressible it is, the easier it is to squeeze it down, the, s the flatter the slope would be. So you can see here the red data points showing for the troposphere, the lower section of the atmosphere, uh, the gas has a certain compressibility and then when it hits the tropopause, for some reason, the gas becomes easier to compress. Now, this turns out to be a killer blow for the ozone heating hypothesis, which I'll explain why in a minute. Um, to show, de de demonstrate this in a slightly different way, here we have the two uh, sounds that I showed earlier. I've put the temperatures uh, on top of each other. So the red one represents the summer temperature for this day last year in Tucson, and the blue one uh, represents the or is the uh, temperature uh, for uh, the winter uh, night one. And when you look at the uh, molar density one, you can see yes, we get the straight lines. It's turned into straight lines, and you can see that the slope of the red one, the hotter one, is less than the slope of the green one, uh, or the blue one, uh, the, the, uh, the colder one. And this is exactly what you would expect from Charles's law. If you put more energy into the gas, it becomes harder to compress and the slope becomes less. And uh, I can show you this again just on a day-night one. This was the same one taken in January uh, in, the, in the morning uh, and at the night. And what you can see here is that during the day, the ground level heats up but at night it cools down. But the rest of the troposphere doesn't change temperature. This is quite a surprise. And I, nobody seems to have bothered looking at this until now. So uh, these are uh, the different uh, models that they had for the tropopause that was come up by the uh, American Atmospheric Standards in 1972. Um, but I, I'll just show what the problems is with the with the, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, maybe I, I, I didn't, uh, I skipped the point. At this slide here, you can see that if you heat the gas, it becomes more compressible, except in the tropopause, where the slope is much bigger. It's about 50% bigger. So this is why the ozone hypothesis heating hypothesis fails, because if it was heating the tropopause, it would become harder to compress. The slope should have gone the other way. It shouldn't have got steeper, it should have got less. So because that is not what happens, that's why the ozone hypothesis, heating hypothesis fails. We have to come up with a different hypothesis. So I'm looking here then at all the different things. Once we realize then that the ozone hypothesis is a failure, we see that there were a lot of other things that we could have looked at to let us know that as well. One is, why is it warmer in the polar winters in the stratosphere when there's no UV light at all? It's dark. Uh, and why is it that in the tropical uh, tropopause uh, the temperature is colder than it is in the, in the other ones? Because presumably there's more UV light. So we can see all of these uh, things where you have problems with the uh, ozone heating hypothesis. We just have to say it's failed. It doesn't work. We now need to come up with something else. And uh, we have uh, put forward this hypothesis here. Again, it's a hypothesis, it's a test. We've subjected it to a lot of tests and it's held up so far, but not enough for us to say this is a theory, uh, this explains everything, because I don't think we've done enough testing of it yet. But you can see, uh, if we went back to uh, the ideal gas law, 
uh, if you looked at the equation down at the bottom, if I keep the temperature or if I keep the pressure constant and I have uh, and I want to change the temperature, one way I could do is be add heat into it, which is what was proposed, and that would cause the temperature to go up. But another way we could have done that was if we reduced n the number of molecules, then uh, to keep the equation balanced, we would have had to rise the temperature. And so our particular thing says that if some of the molecules and the uh, implications from our test so far is that it's oxygen, uh, if it combines, uh, yeah, if 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 it combines to form multimers, then. Um, what happens is that reduces the number of molecules and that would mean that the temperature would go up as well. So this uh, does explain why the temperature would go up without ozone heating. Uh, so getting back to the ideal gas law, what you have is, uh, uh, what it says is that if a gas is in thermodynamic equilibrium, that the work component, the PV section, is balanced by the thermal component, uh, the uh, RT section. And uh, you can use this to that second line, there's P, uh, D and P, and we can calculate T. Uh, so let's go back here to this particular graph, and we can see then what we have is, uh, is this is during the evening when the sun has heated up, we have our three particular uh, equations of state. And what we can see is that if I reuse the, the straight lines, I can refit the temperature profile. And uh, you could see uh, then we get, again, our three different regions, except it changes from one state to the other. But what we can say now, because we have three equations of state, one for each of the uh, boundaries, then each of those layers is in thermodynamic equilibrium. And this turns out to be a very important thing when we get on to looking at the carbon dioxide uh, behavior. So uh, that's just a summary there. I just want to compare our three equations of state model for the temperature profile with the uh, Manabe and Strickler uh, convec radiative convective model, which is used by the modelers today, and I think there's no comparison. Uh, you, can, if you find it hard to see the black line data with the, two, with the three different things. Uh, I'll get on to uh, uh, this again a bit later. Let's go down along. Okay, so in thermodynamics, just to explain what thermodynamics is, uh, with the invention of the steam engine, uh, they were trying to come up with ways of improving the efficiency. So you were turning heat from burning f fuel into mechanical energy, and that's why uh, the, the heat is the thermal bit of the name, and the dy dynamism or the dynamic or movement end is why it, where it got the name thermodynamics. So it's a study of the relationship between uh, mechanical energy and thermal energy. And... Uh, so our, there are a number of thermodynamic laws, but one of them, the well, well known that we'll be using mainly here, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. However, it can be changed from one form to another, and it also can be uh, 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 transmitted from one place to the other. You could, for example, have a hot glass of water and move it to another spot. It's still, you've changed the energy from one side of the room to the other, and so on. What? what the first law doesn't tell you is the rate at which these processes happen. So you, uh, how fast can you move heat from one spot to another, or how fast does it change from mechanical to thermal? The, the first law doesn't tell you that. Instead, we have to resort to measurements. And uh, what we look at is we have a number of different mechanisms have been pro provided for to say how energy can be transmitted from one sa stage to the other. And these are the only mechanisms that are used in the uh, computer models that uh, try to profile the atmosphere. And what we ask is, uh, is this enough? Uh, is there something missing? And what we soon discovered was, yes, there is. Uh, so up until now, people have been saying, Conduction, convection, radiation, and acoustic, like I'm talking to you, so I'm sending the energy uh, through the air, but not uh, the air doesn't actually travel to you. Uh, and I'm, uh, have, we've uh, arranged a simple experiment here that should have been done years ago and would point out an overlooked mechanism for transmitting heat through the atmosphere. So do you want to uh, do that? Or? <laughs> yeah. 
So what we've done is we have here a 100, me, 100, 100 yard, sorry. What we have here is a 100 yard piece of tubing going from one end of the hall to the other. And uh, we have here uh, a plunger. It's, it's, so if you pull that up, Ronan, yeah, if you pull that up, what you can see is within a few seconds, the liquid has been sucked up in the tube. And if you push it back down again, the liquid has been pushed back down. It's, it's the biggest, ling longest, single-use plastic tube that we have at the moment. <laughs> so, so if you just see the red bit there, just lift it up again. Uh, you can see how rapid the response is. Now, this is a very controlled experiment. Put it up a bit higher there, Ron. Yeah. This is a very controlled experiment. This experiment, we can calculate how all the different mechanisms uh, 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 contribute to causing us to do this work on the, uh, on the water in the container. Can I just, just add, just to make it clearer, to just reiterate, that I'm applying here work energy. You know, I'm, it is this PV, I'm moving it. And the work energy is being transmitted through this big, long, uh, 100 meter tube, which contains air. And then it's, the energy is ending up over here. The work energy has been done at the other end. So, we, yeah. so this is mechanical energy. So this is a mechanism of transmitting energy mechanically. But now, up until now, all the models have been worried about transmitting energy using thermal processes. So we have calculated exactly what the energy transmission is for each of these mechanisms. And you can see here that the overall rate at which the energy has been transmitted down along that tube, it's a very small, narrow tube, but if we were to make a one meter square, that would be two and a half thousand watts of energy is the rate of energy transferred out of that, that tube. Whereas all the me methods just used by the, the, uh, the computer models and the theories up until now come to less than two watts. So for some bizarre reason, people have ignored an energy transmission mechanism that's uh, three orders of magnitude greater than any of the others. And we, we looked to see if where people would uh, describe this in the literature, and there wasn't anything. We had to come up with our own name for it, which we call perfection. Uh, but I, another term would be, you know, true, true mass, mass energy, energy transmission, transmission, mechanical, mechanical energy, energy transmission. So this can go against the temperature. That water could be colder or hotter. It wouldn't affect the rate at which the mechanical energy is transmitted. So it's independent of the thermal transmission mechanisms. So in other words, we could freeze the uh, syringe at one end and heat that up to boiling water, and the energy would still, mechanical energy would transmit from the colder to the hotter direction. Uh, yeah. So just to give an explanation for how this would happen, here we have the famous Newton's cradle. And if you apply mechanical energy, you can see, imagine that they are the atoms inside in the tube. You can see you apply the mechanical energy at one end, it comes out the other end, but the molecules in between don't move. Uh, they vibrate back and forth a bit, but they don't move from one end of the device to the other. And this is what we think is happening Yeah, I'll, well. I'll just, just show it in that, like, again, what we're doing here is, this is uh, obviously not By, uh, air, but you can see that, like, I'm applying work energy here, and the work energy ends up on the other side, but the, uh, the balls in between, they're staying where they are. So the, the energy has been transmitted from one side to the other without the, this The moving. interesting thing is that this mechanism that's happening in the Newton's cradle can't be described using the standard uh, models. Uh, maybe now, if they include perfection into it, it might be uh, possible. Um, what we're saying is, we believe that there are greenhouse gases, that they absorb uh, energy and they emit energy. And one of the, of Einstein's famous paper that he published exactly 100 years ago today in 1919, he showed that if a gas was in thermodynamic equilibrium, the rate of absorption by a, a, an infrared gas, the rate of absorption was equal to the rate of emission. So in other words, if you increase the amount of 
infrared active gases in the atmosphere, you will increase the rate of absorption, but at the exact same time, you will increase the rate of emission. So if the gas is in thermodynamic equilibrium, you won't get a greenhouse effect. It won't store the energy. And what we have shown by our data is yes, the gas, the air is in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, the climate models have decided to ignore Einstein's, uh, Einstein, when he came up with the equation, he said the rate of absorption is equal to the rate of emission, but there were two types of emission. One was the standard emission from a hot body, a random one. The other one is photo-induced emission. And this is the emission that's used for to develop uh, lasers and so on. But what that says is that an, uh, 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 what will happen is that the infrared active gases will aid the transfer of energy from a hot area to a cold area, but it won't store the energy. So, uh, let me go back to then uh, comparing the night and day. Uh, wh what I'm looking at here is uh, showing you that this, this is not a, a one-off event. Uh, the one that I showed you in January, here's Tucson for the start of this month, the first week or so. Uh, and what I want to draw your attention to is that every night, day the temperature gets heated up and every day uh, it cools down at night. But the central bit, the central tropopause, that doesn't go through rapid temperature changes. So what happens to the energy that's stored in the boundary layer? Remember, you're talking of about two and a half tonnes of uh, air per square metre. It's a lot of energy. Uh, and this is just representing it another way. Uh, the bottom axis is time, so this is for the entire month of May. You can see at ground level the temperature zooms up and down, and by the time you get up to uh, 700, that day-night variation is gone. But the lower uh, up uh, uh, ones, they are, but they, they, they don't have the same day-night effect. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out here is that um, that, that energy data, what we're told is that's supposed to be heating up. Uh, the, the, as you can see here, I've plotted the humidity, the amount of water vapor in grams per cubic meter uh, that was in the atmosphere that you also get from the same radio balloon data. And uh, if what we are led to believe were true, what we should see is that energy at night it's going, it's vanishing, it's going somewhere. Uh, I say it's going out to space, but if it was being trapped by infrared gases. Then on the third, slide three and slide four, that's interesting, or slide six, uh, you have uh, a water vapor there in the atmosphere at the night, so that should be trapping the atmosphere. What it actually does is it cools it. In other words, the atmosphere is behaving exactly as Einstein's law predicts, uh, not as the global warming things. So in other words, the infrared water vapour is serving to cool the atmosphere at night even faster. Uh, and the other thing that you'll see is that, uh, the, that during the day, the water vapour there, that acts to heat up the atmosphere, it's true, because you've got the sunlight coming in, and that sunlight is being absorbed. And if you looked at the spectrum we showed earlier, that's why uh, we, we see uh, the water vapour things. So we'll go on to our new findings. Uh, but what I can say is the data from the weather balloons has shown quite categorically there is no greenhouse effect. Increasing greenhouse gases will increase the rate of absorption, but because the atmosphere is in thermodynamic equilibrium, it also increases the rate of emission. The next net effect is no. OK. So, uh, the, the, yeah, we, it, it, there's a lot of material there, and like we'd encourage you to, to read, to look at, through the, uh, those papers that are on that OPRJ website. Uh, we are, that was like five years ago that we put, uh, put those, but like we, we haven't gone static since then, and so we continue to. It's, we have also been writing a lot of papers with Willie and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have been carrying out this other work, and this work, again, we will be publishing with Willie shortly. Yeah, yeah. So we're just uh, writing up at, at the process a, a couple of papers. Uh, we, I don't, I don't, we don't have a whole lot of time, so we'll just kind of speed through this, just to give you a flavour of what's coming down the tracks. Um, and just, okay, on the lapse rate, um, 
This is the, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the standard atmosphere and the lapse rates as you go up in the atmosphere according to that. And you can see it's a very lot of straight lines. What we've done on the right-hand side is we've looked at, I think there's about uh, five million weather balloons uh, used for compiling those particular averages, uh, going back to the 50s and in some cases even further. And what we're finding is, broadly, the, if you were to try and fit the right-hand graphs in terms of straight lines, it's, it's, it's kind of okay. But the reality is that the lapse rate isn't as straight. Uh, it's not exactly six and a half. It's, it changes. And it, now the next point is, those are averages. At any given uh, mandated level, if you look at the lapse rates there, the average is of the order of six and a half in the troposphere. But you need to look at histograms. So it's not a constant. And uh, the implications of that, oh, well, I want to hurry on this one. OK, so but the implications. Can, remember the convective adjustment. That was assuming that the lapse rate was exactly six and a half. It's not. There's a lot of variability. And there's an intriguing paradox that's implicit in the current models. What they're doing is they're assuming that, I will talk about this in a second, but that each of the layers of the atmosphere is thermodynamically isolated from above and below it. That's how the, the greenhouse effect is supposed to lead to certain parts of the atmosphere heating up from the IR activity. But simultaneously, they're assuming a constant fixed lapse rate. So what they're saying is if the temperature at uh, 500 millibars increases because of CO2, half a degree, that that is, is simultaneously occurring at the ground. So you, in, in other words, that it's, they're thermodynamically connected. So you, ca you can't, uh, you know, they want to uh, eat their cake and still have it. Um, I, I hear you want to talk about this one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just quickly. Okay, so, so um, this is uh, taken in Germany. The reason we used that was that Germany has a very good uh, radio sound program. They emit four, or send up four every day. Uh, and so we have twice as much data on any one day. And again, you can see the exact same phenomena. The day-night uh, thing is, is, but now it has four points in it. Uh, by the time you get up to 850, it's almost gone, and you can't see any trace of it then. But here is the interesting thing. If you look between the 400, uh, the, well, if you look at the, uh, the uh, 500 and the 450, one, or the 400 one, you see there's synchronization there between them. Uh, it's not a 24-hour synchronization, but it's some uh, of the order of four, three or four days. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if you look at the 200 one, above the, strat the stra start of the stratosphere, that's anti-synchronized. It's going in the opposite direction. So what it is happening is whatever's causing this change in the uh, compressibility of the, the gas, whether it's our multimer hypothesis or something else, if the area that can compress jumps way down, which is what we saw from the video, then that would mean that we're decreasing, we would be making a sort of partial vacuum and that uh, we would be sucking up the air from down below and pulling the air from the stratosphere down. Now if you pull air upwards it gets colder and if you pull it down it gets warmer and that's why we think that you have this anti-synchronized duration above the, the strata the tropopause it's going uh, in one direction it's going down or up and it's doing the alteration so uh, so what michael was describing about the correlations and anti-correlations we we what we're doing here is what we find is the temperature at which that phase change, that's the, the point of intersection between those two lines, if you recall, of the molar density pressure plots. The point of intersection, if we measure the temperature there, we find that that temperature goes up and down, up and down. If you look at the ground temperature, that goes up and down. And what we're finding is, if you take for a given time of the day to, to remove the, uh, the day-night effect, you can look and see how is the temperatures at each of the mandated levels uh, correlated to the ground temperature, Tg, and the temperature of the phase change, Tp. 
and uh, we're looking at just for one zone for this preview here, which is 470 stations, about 10 million balloons uh, over a 30-year period from 1989 to 2018. This is just for January, we're just showing you. What we find is that the temperature changes at ground are quite correlated to the changes as you go up in the atmosphere. That's the one on the left. But you can see that it rapidly falls off and that up near the stratosphere, it actually becomes slightly anti-correlated, but there's almost no correlation. If, however, we look at the phase change, the TP, this is the point of intersection. If we look at the temperature of that da uh, dashed black line in the video Michael was showing you, um, that correlates far better with the bulk of the atmosphere, like we're talking of 70%. It's anti-correlated in the troposphere and correlated above the troposphere. And uh, you, when you do R squared, you can see this. And I just want to stress, sorry, I just want to stress that graph on the right Nobody has been looking at this, this intersection of molar density plots before. So this is a new result, completely new. Nobody is looking at it. It's, it's, and, and that seems to be the one that seems to explain everything best. Just what we think for the climate models, like my background is in computer modeling. That was my PhD. I'm not a critic of computer models as so they're a very useful tool but they should be continually compared with data and observations so you know there is a nobody has been looking at this they've just been assuming the models are are the best we've got and we should be checking at experiments and so um there the different improvements we believe should be made I don't know if there's time for questions. We have another three minutes before the clock, actually. So, you have, sir, you have eight minutes. Eight minutes. Oh, so. eight minutes. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, ask questions. questions. Yeah. I'm a retired operational weather guy. I used to be the weather unit commander here 40 yes. years ago at yes. Davis Monton, um, and I'm also a sailplane pilot. Um, so all the stuff that you're saying makes perfect sense. Uh, like I say, I come to, to this from an operational weather yeah. uh, point of view. We know that the atmosphere is transparent to visible radiation. Yes. It, yeah. it, and, and that's yeah. what you're showing. Yes. Um, and, and where there are no greenhouse gases, it's tran transparent to the infrared radiation as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and, but... but now, another thing I want to point out is that if you look at the newspapers, the newspapers have a lot of information if only the people critiquing this would pay attention. Yeah. One example was uh, about a year and a half ago in Siberia, it got as cold as it ever gets in the Northern Hemisphere. It was in USA, uh, USA Today. Well, if it's as cold as it ever has been in the northern hemisphere. Where's the trapped heat? Yeah. And yeah. also, you go up to Canada. You know, uh, Edmonton breaks the the cold temperature what? by yeah. 12 Celsius, 20 Fahrenheit. Not just Edmonton, but 100 kilometers around it. Where's the trapped heat? Obviously, it doesn't exist. That's yeah. all I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Enjoyed a, your talk. And we agree with you, right? <laughs> Quick question, Michael. Yeah. On your slide, summary of prevention experiment, yeah. yes. the term that overwhelms that uh, discussion is the acoustic transmission, uh, 1.4 watts per meter squared. I'm lost on acoustic transmission. Okay, acoustic transmission is how you communicated with me. In other words, when you moved your tongue, you created vibrations in the air, which was mechanical energy, which then came and vibrated my ear, uh, so that's what acoustic transmission is, just sound, sound waves. And it so happens that that particular experiment we have de devised there is um, a, a low-pass filter. So anything with a frequency of less than one hertz wouldn't be able to pass through it. And uh, so 
what we're saying is the acoustic energy can't get through that pipe. I, I'd like to just add just a point, we, which we discuss in the, in the papers referring to that. I think it's the third paper on that open ERJ website. But you can think of, uh, you have AC and DC, it, like ele electric city. You have this uh, alternating current, and then you have a, a, a DC based signal. And so we could think of, because acoustic energy or sound is a wave, Form it. You could think of it as called almost the acoustic, the AC component of uh, of mechanical, mechanical energy, energy transmission. But what we're look describing here is the DC component of mechanical energy transmission. So while it is obviously sound has been studied. Yeah. very heavily, so everyone is very familiar of sound as a what, mechanism of transmission. What we're actually saying is, and this is well known to aircraft engineers, and I think there's a few of them around here, uh, what actually happens is that if a, an aeroplane is travelling at less than a tenth of the speed of sound, then the air is best treated as if it's not compressible, as if it's a, a, an uncompressible material. And uh, what that means is it acts like a rigid rod. So you could look upon this big long tube of air because it's taking, it's traveling at about 34 uh, meters per second, less than the speed of sound or less than 10%. So it's like as if it's a, a, a long rigid rod and you just push it at one end and it sticks out the other end. I, 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 and uh, we, after the record, uh, well, we're on the record, but it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> you've the, heard of the giant of uh, the large the hadron, large hadron, hadron collider. collider, hadron collider, hadron collider. Hadron collider. Hadron collider. Yeah. collider. Um, what we have called this here is the large hard rod collider, <laughs> be, because of what it's doing to all those beautiful models. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, go yeah, on. One one last question here, simple. Uh, Energy, energy transfer, and in my mind, I'm a geophysicist, and yeah. one of the things that occurs to me is, is that we have a lot of solar interaction with, our, uh, with Earth and energy being transmitted from our borealis and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the auroras that we see, and we, and we wonder if there's, at those high altitudes, whether, whether any of that energy impacts uh, our gases in the atmosphere. Well, in those uh, diagrams that we showed you there where the uh, phase change was moving up and down, and we found that when you dampened out the day-night thing, you were still getting these uh, fluctuations. What causes that, we don't know yet. Uh, that's still an open question. Uh, there are... Uh, the reason it's an open question is nobody even taught to ask it until now. 